This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. Today we're taking a look at the first revelation. By the way, uh, I hope you know that it's not called Revelations. You know, you look in your Bible, I hear a lot of people refer to it. Hey, we're studying Revelations. No, we're not. We're studying Revelation. There's no Revelations. Just a little pet peeve of mine. I just want you to know. And in Revelation, there is this first revelation that is, that is mentioned in starting with verse 9. And that's what we're going to take a look at today and probably over the next, uh, I don't know if we'll finish it next Sunday. If we don't finish it next Sunday, I think we will. But uh, if, if not, then uh, the following Sunday. But it is a very important revelation. It is the first revelation that comes along. And it comes from, uh, from John. Now, John, who was a disciple... Uh, was in Patmos. He, was, he had been banished to Patmos for political reasons. <clears throat> and Patmos was just this little island uh, in the Mediterranean. And it was a place where they would just, and they, they would do this a lot. They would find little islands that were like prisons, but they would just take prisoners and take them off and dump them there. And they were on their own. I mean, they didn't give them any food or water or anything. They just took them and they dumped them. They were, they were banished to these to these islands, and they had to fend for themselves. And he was there for, for a while, and while he was there was where he received this revelation, this ri- and he wrote uh, this for the seven churches that he had responsibility over that were on the, the Asian mainland there. <clears throat> so when we talk about the seven churches, those were the seven churches that, that, uh, that John was familiar with and worked with, and he wrote this for them and for Christians in general. So we begin with, with this first revelation, that, this first vision that he saw, and he refers to it in verse 9. He says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And what John is just basically saying is, guys, you know me. You know, you know my heart. You know where I'm coming from. You know my credibility. You know who I am. And so... Um, I, I am coming to you with this revelation, with this vision. But I want you to know that I'm coming here and I'm writing this because I believe it. And the cost of discipleship is a high cost. And really what he's saying, I, I love how he describes himself. He says, I'm suffering for the word of God and I'm suffering for the testimony or his testimony for Jesus. And he's saying, Guys, that's what's coming. We're going to, we're going to do this. We're, as Christians, it's going to happen in our lives. We're going to have to suffer. We're going to have to stand firm on what we believe. We're going to have to stand on the Word of God and be willing to suffer for our testimony for Jesus. You have to be that willing to do that. And John says, that's what's happened. That's why I'm here. But that's not what he wants us to see and notice. Uh, John has a vision. And thus begins this revelation. Now, it's important to remember that as we study in the entire book of Revelation, it's important to remember that what John was describing was what he saw. And sometimes his descriptions are limited by human language uh, or by human experience. And you'll notice John will say things like, it looked like, it uh, sounded like, it appeared to be, it was moving like, it seemed to, uh, things like that. And we have to take that into consideration because he's, he's saying that in the light of his own experience and perhaps even culture. And so when we study Revelation, we have to take that into consideration. And when we do, then uh, we're able to get a better understanding and a clearer picture of what he saw. For example, there's a, a and we'll study this later on, uh, the, out of the abyss come this, the locust. And people used to speculate and say, well, he was probably, probably that was what it looked like to him. He said that's it's what it appeared to be. But that's what it looked like to him when, in fact, some people say it was probably, you know, helicopters now coming out to, to do war. And, uh, and so it was probably those, those helicopters coming out. And, and people say, well, you know, that, that would be a pretty big locust, you know. Uh, but, but now we look at it and we say, you know what, it could be drones, even small drones. And now the government is working with what, what they call UA, unmanned aircraft, uh, and there's lots of drones that they're, they're specializing in that are like s- miniature helicopters that can get into small areas and maneuver into, into areas that uh, they wouldn't normally be able to take, like the kind of drones that we have now that are big. Uh, but they can take these, these smaller UA into these locations. And so now it starts to make sense. So in the context of what, what John 
when John writes, he's writing in the context of what it appeared like to him or what he saw or what it seemed to be to him. Now, there are times when he says, this is what it is. But when we're studying it, we have to be careful that we're, that we're interpreting it in the light of his experience. This is what he saw or this is what it seemed to do to him. So keep that in mind as we study it, and I'll certainly be trying to point that out as we go along. So John has a vision, and the first thing that he sees is Jesus. That's the very, that's where it all begins. It all begins with the revelation of Jesus. And so one, what we're going to do for the next few verses is see an amazing description of a resurrected and transcended Jesus. This is not the Jesus limited by human form that walked on the earth, but a Jesus who is fully empowered and emblazoned, uh, sitting on the throne, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And this is how we are to see Jesus now. We tend to look at Jesus now and, and look at him as the guy who walked around with sandals and a robe and, you know, he's going around doing really cool things and healing people and, and teaching and, you know, and, and uh, uh, you know, that's the kind of Jesus, that's the way we think of him now. But this is the Jesus that we are to see now. This Jesus, the way that, that uh, John describes him, is the way that we're to see him now because that Jesus no longer exists. That human Jesus no longer exists. Now he's transcended and now he's on the throne and this is the Jesus that we worship now. This is who he is. So let's take a look at him. Uh, and the first thing that John says is that I was in the Spirit. Verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. We can only see Jesus through the Spirit. That's really important for us to understand. We have to have that connection that comes through the Spirit of God. John 4, verse 24 says, God is Spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in Spirit and truth. Now, let's look at those two words, Spirit and truth. The word Spirit tells us that God is not limited or defined by anything physical. Think about that. God is not limited or defined by anything physical. Therefore, he must be worshipped that way. With our soul, which is our mind, will, and emotions, and our very being. We have to worship him as spirit. In other words, not in the physical sense. There is a physical part of it because we are physical. But we're worshipping in spirit, connecting with him in spirit. Don't let people fool you. There is a, this has been going on for some time. It's a form of Gnosticism that says, it's called the energy God concept. And it's this idea that everything is energy and therefore everything is God. So table, uh, a table is a form of energy. Therefore, it is partly God. Or a rock is a form of energy. Therefore, it's partly God. You got to be some 50 shades of stupid to believe that. Um, because all of that was created by God. And so you have to understand that God is not limited by the physical. He is not physical. He is not limited or defined by anything physical. And so he is spirit, and so we have to worship him that way. And the word truth is the word aletheia. It's a beautiful name. It's a word we, we, uh, we give girls. And it is a word that means truth, but it also means faithfulness. It's, a, it's also the word for faithfulness. And so God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and faithfulness. There has to be that connection that's very real in our lives, and so we, we are committed to it and continue in it. And it is something that develops a consistency in our life as we continue to grow. So we can only see Jesus in and through the spirit. So what are some of his characteristics that we see that are mentioned here in this passage in Revelation? Well, first of all, the first thing he noticed was his voice. His voice. Uh, his voice represents his authority. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a, in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. Now, the trumpet symbolizes a call to attention. It's always, anytime you see a trumpet mentioned in the Bible, it always refers to a call to uh, attention. It may be prayer, it may be war, uh, it may be a warning, whatever it is, but the trumpet represents a call to attention. And so there was this call to attention, this voice where Jesus was basically saying, pay attention to this. The trumpet was only used for times when a response was required. That's very important to understand also. Anytime you see a trumpet in the scriptures, a trumpet being used, it always required a response. 
you were either to respond in prayer, you were either to respond in, uh, b- to the warning, you were either to respond to war, whatever the case may be. The trumpet always required a response. This voice, sounding like a trumpet, requires a response. And then to compare it in verse 15 as rushing waters uh, is, a, is a picture of how unstoppable and overwhelming and overpowering it is. Now, I have never heard audibly the voice of God. And I'll guarantee you, you haven't heard audibly the voice of God. You may have heard a voice. You may have heard something that sounded like a voice. You may have actually audibly heard something in your life that you thought was God. But you ain't heard this. You have not heard the loud voice like a trumpet or a voice that sounded like the roar of many waters. You haven't heard the voice. If you did hear a voice, it was because somebody, God had an angel tone it down so you could hear it. But this was not, this the voice of Jesus now. Compare that to the voice of Jesus who would stand in a boat and speak to the people on the mountainside. Compare that to a man who would say, walk up to a man who was, who was crippled and say, get up and walk. Compare that voice to the voice of Jesus now. This is the Jesus we worship now. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Class, we want to thank you for watching. We hope it was a blessing.